so uh, thanks for having me here today. I think I'm going to be a little bit different than most of your speakers. Uh, I don't have a clearance, and I don't engage in cyber warfare, and uh, I actually don't work for DOD or any law enforcement body. So uh, really, the take that our organization brings to this comes largely from the commercial side of the cybersecurity space. But the take that I've always had is that, in fact, this is a singular ecosystem. So the reason why we face national security threats goes hand in glove with the fact that we face threats left and right and that it's kind of a, a false dichotomy to, to separate between the two. But I'm not going to talk about masterful Chinese cyber hackers in this talk, just to be clear. Uh, so just to give some context where I'm coming from, so I direct uh, this uh, thing called the Seaside. I'm not going to repeat it again. It's one of the four uh, national uh, cyber trust research centers. Uh, we get a lot of support both from the government and from industry tasked with the job of dealing with kind of large-scale cyber threats. So not people breaking into your computer, but people breaking into 100,000 computers. So worms, viruses, DDoS, uh, spyware, this kind of stuff. So um, we started off this effort really with three goals. All right? And our first goal was what we called uh, Internet Epidemiology. Our center was founded in response to the first large-scale Internet worms, uh, uh, Code Red, and so forth. And so this was measuring and understanding the scale of, uh, of internet outbreaks. And then the, the next goal was uh, building automated defenses so we could do things on the time scale of outbreaks. And then there was this thing um, that you guys don't have to deal with, but in academia, when you write for grants uh, to the National Science Foundation, they ask about your broader impact. Since we had um, economic and legal stuff. We'll do some of that, sure. And we had no intention of really doing very much there, I'm going to be honest. And this talk is going to be a little bit about why uh, we were wrong, and we did some work in the first space, and it didn't matter, and we should have been working on, uh, on the, the economic stuff. Uh, so just to, you know, looking back, by all kind of normal measures, this was an incredibly successful effort four years in. Uh, we had, you know, by academic standards, tons of papers. We had um, built big systems, so the uh, UCSD Network Telescope that's hosted here uh, currently monitors over 1% of all routable internet addresses. If you've ever seen any measurements of the growth of any kind of internet outbreak, it probably came either from this data or a copy of this uh, infrastructure. We had the largest honeypot system on the planet based on some <laughs> unique virtual machine technology built here. Uh, and we had a system that demonstrated that you could learn signatures online in the line card in under a millisecond. That got spun out. If you buy a Cisco router next year, that technology will be in the line card. So this was a huge success. And yet, the problem um, was no better, right? So we could basically say, rah, rah, we've done all these great things. But in fact, uh, worms didn't go away, and malware increased, and cybercrime got worse. And we actually hadn't achieved anything when you really get down to it, nor had anybody else. And I think for any reasonable measure of uh, our performance against the bad guys in cybersecurity, the bad guys are winning. And so the question you might ask yourself is why? Why are the bad guys winning? And there are a number of answers, but the one that I'm going to talk about a little bit today is because there is a fallacy that many of us in the community, myself included, have ascribed to, that this is a technical problem, that computer security is, is like math. If you just did it right, then everything would be secure, and then there, you wouldn't have any problems. And, um, and in fact, there are a lot of other factors involved, and one of the ones that I'm going to go into is this issue of economics. Um, but I want to take a step back for a second and say, look, what changed why do we have these big problems now that we didn't have before? And I'd say there are three big changes that happened in the 21st century that changed the way you look at cyber threats. All right, so one is starting around 99, 2000, it becomes totally feasible to compromise gazillions of hosts. All right? it, well, this was a onesie twosie kind of stuff in the 1990s. And you know, if someone was really good, maybe they'd take over 100 hosts. I mean, those big denial of service attacks that first got people's attention that took down Yahoo and E-Trade and so forth, that was maybe 150 hosts. Right? That, was, that was big stuff in the late 90s. Uh, so what changed, we have this combination of an internet model that lets anyone talk to anyone. And then we have largely homogeneous software. 
and I mean this in every, I mean, I'm not picking on Microsoft. Everyone runs Acrobat, everyone runs, runs Flash, everyone runs a handful of things. And then we have a user base who really can't be expected to be security experts. So we've done studies where uh, we find people going to malicious sites, and then they say, why don't you execute this file? It's funny. And one in 10 people say yes, even though their antivirus tells them not to do it. All right? And so there's no fix to the software that is going to fix that problem. Um, then people figure out in, again, late 90s, early 2000s that, hey, we can take all of these you know, thousands of hosts that we control, and we can control them centrally. And this became known as botnets. All right? So we can actually link these things together and, tr and allow us to scale up an application. I mean, this is kind of cloud computing about a decade early, but it's the bad guys. Uh, and then finally, in the part that I'm going to talk about, because I think it, it really drives these, because the first two things were not, did not suddenly become possible in the last few years. They've been possible for a decade. The thing that, um, that really makes this stand out is that people realize they could make money. All right? And there's two ways they can make money. They can sell your commodity resources, that's your bandwidth, your storage, your so forth, or they can sell the unique resources you have, whether they're very common resources like bank account numbers or unique resources like the you know, plans to your new airplane or whatever you know, thing this community would care about. But it, you know, it's, it's unique data that you're going to monetize. Um, all right, so just to give some, you know, people some context on this, this is actually a very recent thing. Right? This did not happen as recently as about five or six years ago. And it all really happens because of something that seems very banal, which is spam. All right? the, the efforts in anti-spam, blocking people from sending messages from a singular place, forced the bad guys to launder the origin of their email through third parties, which caused them to cement a relationship between the malware authors, who at that time we're just doing this for giggles. I mean, if pre-2000, malware at worst would maybe erase something. It had no purpose. It would probably put something on your screen saying, ha, I got you. Most, most viruses that, for example, Symantec protected you against up until 2001 were what are called zoo viruses. They had never been released into the wild. They were given to Symantec to show they could do it. All right, so as soon as these people connect, and effectively, they said, look, you've taken over 20,000 hosts. Why don't you put a mail forwarder in there, and I'll pay you a cut on, on the money that I make. This suddenly means that the better you can infect more hosts and keep them infected longer and have them be high quality, you can make more money. And this creates what they call in uh, economics a virtuous economic cycle, which is kind of funny in this domain, but it's exactly the same process. The better you are at this, the more money you make. Soon after this, literally within two years, you have a fluid third-party market for hosts. Hosts are commodities. All right? And when I say third-party market, I mean buy and sell. There's bid and ask. Price goes up towards Christmas, because that's when there's more demand. Price goes down afterwards. There's special orders. There are vertical integrators. You can say, I have hosts that have a lot of bandwidth. You want .gov hosts? I can buy those. They'll cost me more, but I can definitely get those. You want <laughs> .mil hosts? No problem. I mean, it's just you slice and dice it. There's, you can buy very cheap hosts, very cheap. You can buy better hosts for more money. This, um, what I would like to convince you is, this is, has become a platform economy. The platform is botnets. You can take over a gazillion hosts, control them from one place. We now have innovation in the platform, making it harder to take down, harder to find. And we have innovation in the vertical applications, where the vertical applications are everything from DDoS, you know, piracy, spam, uh, info theft, those are all just applications built on this same platform. So I'm just going to give you a couple examples that are dated because, you know, who has time to update all these things? But so this is, you know, 2005, Guy is offering the DDoS attack service, uh, sliding scale fee based on how big your site is. He'll give you a demo to prove that he has the goods, and then, you know, anonymous email to contact him. Um, these are people offering. Uh, Spam remailing services at the going rate somewhere between three and six cents per bot week. All right. And the, you'll notice some of this jargon here, like on the last one, type of service for <coughs> slots. This basically is so, this is like virtualization, right? They are this is the moral equivalent to you know cutting your raw cocaine with something else. You are sharing it you're, with other people, so it's not as good. Um, here's an outfit. This is a particular piece of uh, spyware called Metafisher. Um, this is the command and control system for this that is tracking the country of origin for the hosts 
that have been compromised so that they can then resell those to third parties who buy them. I'd like some Italian hosts, some German hosts, and so forth. Now, why might you want that? I'll get back to that in a second. Um, this particular piece of software also has an incredibly nice GUI for updating itself. You want to add a new exploit, no problem. You can download from third parties. You integrate with their front end. It says, this exploit should be activated for this browser. I mean, this is, this is nice stuff. So if you compare malware pre-2000 to modern malware, the old stuff was riddled with bugs. The new stuff is really good. I mean, it's really good software. Uh, you know, the other side of this is, uh, as an aside, vulnerabilities used to be something that people would, when they found them, they would talk about them just to get credit. These days, you sell them, right? And there's a public market, right? You can go to iDefense. You can, you know, the U.S. government buys vulnerabilities, right? They don't talk about it, but yeah, they will pay you uh, for vulnerabilities. So, so all of this stuff is about, is about money at this point. Here's my favorite one. This is outsourcing taken to its logical conclusion. So this is an outfit called iFrame Dollars. And their, their business is, suppose you've managed to compromise some websites. Maybe it's your own website, but you don't know how to monetize that. All you know is, you know, I have the password to UCSD's website. I don't know how to make money. So they say, no problem. Take this little bit of HTML on the bottom, put it on the website, and then anyone who visits the website, that will create an iframe that will point them to the latest and greatest web exploits that we build. And they update every six hours. They are not detected by anybody, and they have the latest stuff. Anyone who's infected now by visiting your website, they will pay you a commission. All right? And the commission varies. You may not be able to read this. So that right there, you know, price for Asia has gone up to $15 per thousand. Uh, and the reason for this is that there are different demands in the different markets. Well, why are there different demands in the different markets? Let's suppose I've stolen a whole bunch of um, Italian credit cards. All right? I now want to use those. But um, the, uh, when I do a purchase, the e-merchant that I've used checks the bin on the front of the credit card, that's the first you know, 46 digits, and figures out that it's from a bank in Italy and wants my IP address to be from Italy too, because it's pretty weird to have a guy in Albonia using an Italian credit card. So the way that I deal with this problem is I buy Italian hosts. That lets me, that lets me monetize my Italian credit cards, no problem. All right, so we also have these very deep structural asymmetries that make it hard to fight this threat. So on the one hand, and this has been mentioned many times. We have this uh, defenders are, uh, are reactive, attackers are, are proactive. By and large, only bad malware writers are detected. And the reason for that is they download the detection software because we sell it, and they only release the malware after it can't be detected. I mean, we, it is, you're, you're, you're a moron to release malware that is detected because it's so easy not to. And there are third-party services that they don't want to buy ESET and McAfee and Symantec. They can just contract to a third party who will check it for them. Uh, so the best case that we're going to be in is to catch up, find yesterday's stuff. And, and we're doing worse and worse at this. This is you know, the dirty little secret of AV is the fraction of the new stuff that we catch is smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, for us, defenses are expensive because we are invested in particular business models. If I sell AV, I sell AV, and that's my market. If I sell firewalls, I sell firewalls, and that's my market. We have established what we do, and you can't just abandon that on a dime. The bad guy can abandon their stuff on a dime easily. When Microsoft added the firewall and it became hard to do network-based exploits, they said, fine, we'll do web-based exploits, right? The firewall company doesn't help you there. They're protecting against packets coming in. That's not the problem anymore. You're going to websites. It's a different... They can be so much more agile because they have nothing invested. Um, deterrent, we've mentioned. I'm gonna, not going to go into that. Uh, here's what I think one of the biggest ones is, as has been mentioned before, we have no real good way of measuring currently our security. There's no kind of evidence-based security the way we have evidence-based medicine. In fact, I would bet that all of your organizations buy an AV vendor's product for which you have no empirical evidence that it's better than their competitor. And the reason I suspect that is because n these studies don't exist. <laughs> Um, so largely speaking, the security industry compares on the basis of integration, price, you know, deals with other things and so forth. The bad guys have a perfect way to measure how good their stuff is. Do they make more money or not? All right? If they're not making more money, don't do that anymore. If they are, then do more of that. And, and they're very good at it. All right. So just a uh, you know, really quick uh, summary just to use spam as an example. You know, in the early days, people send spam from a single host, so we come up with blacklisting. Don't accept mail from those hosts. 
They said, we'll route our mail through open proxies, mail servers that would allow mail to be sent that was originated from a place other than the owner of the mail server. So we created blacklists for those who made everyone fix their proxies. So we forced them to do botnets. It's our fault, in fact, that we have botnets. It, this is kind of uh, you know, forced co-evolution. Uh, so uh, we came up with um, uh, content-based learning, Bayesian filtering and so forth to try to deal with this problem. They came up with chaff, polymorphic spam, image-based spam, all these other things to get around those filters. We said, we're just going to take down the sites they point to. They invent fast flux, uh, fast flux redirects where you can't even tell where the site is being hosted because the stuff is going up and down every five minutes. So we say, CAPTCHAs, prove to me that you're a host. Do you know how much it costs to solve a CAPTCHA? One five thousandth of a cent, all right? We have a study measuring this. We go and buy this stuff. You, you buy it literally in lots of 100,000. Right? It's just incredibly cheap. They do all languages. It's absolutely not a problem. All right. So um, the problem, I think, is that we spend all our time thinking about this in terms of a technical problem that's going to have some solution that involves securing. We just need to secure the systems better, and then we'll be OK. And so you know, currently, depending on which you know, random pundit you trust, you know, somewhere between 50 and $100 billion in direct uh, cybersec expenditures. And most of that has been securing the end host. Now, if, let's suppose you're a strategic person. And I tell you, all right, you have some resources you need to secure, you know, the perimeter of such and such a thing. We have picked the place that is the single most expensive to secure because it's, you know, all computers. And is the single hardest point to secure because it is administered by a hundred, you know, however many hundred million different people, and it's full of holes, right? And we have no control of either of those things. Um, and then if we think about it, well, if really we're doing the right thing, then this, these should be valuable assets. But no, if I want to buy your computer, maybe it's a buck fifty, right? This is not the valuable asset to them, right? They'll just get some other computers and, you know, sift through it until they get, they get what they want. So my premise is that we want to be focusing on the economic bottlenecks that they have, which are, I would argue, um, a lot narrower and a lot cheaper to address. But to do that, you need to actually understand how their business works. And uh, I think I have some more time. Yeah, OK. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some work we've done in this space uh, looking at, at this problem. So just to give people a flavor, um, the breadth of uh, what gets called euphemistically the underground economy. Uh, so. We have really four kinds of activities that go on. We have activities that involve the acquisition of, of illicit goods, and we separate between two kinds of goods. Goods that um, can be made liquid in one step, so bank accounts, credit cards, things that, have, that you can price directly based on their equivalent in, in the real world, and goods that um, are valued only in the underground economy. You couldn't, does, my grandmother does not want botnets. Um, but that, in fact, can be used to create wealth. And so services, botnets, people who help in scams, there's lots of individual component parts. Then there is a market that involves the trade and sale of these goods. And the market's very important because it allows you to scale. All right? So if you have five people, you are limited by what you can do with five, five people, and they have certain specialties. If you get lots of people together in a market, then prices go down, people can specialize, and so forth. Um, then we have scams, which is a place where people combine um, digital goods, frequently these tier two goods, with some campaign, you know, cr value creation strategy and some capital to create new money. So, spam, phishing, DDoS, you know, uh, info theft, extortion, what have you, all fall into this category. Uh, and then finally, there's the part where they need to take the money out, all right, cash out, which is one of the hardest parts. And this can either be um, uh, indirect, so they might, in fact, do this by, uh, by selling a, a product for a third party, um, click fraud, things like this where the, the money is actually caused to flow. So like in stock scams, they cause the price of the stock to change and by then trading elsewhere, they can take the money out on the backside. Or it can be direct, particularly when they've stolen financial instruments, wire transfer, uh, creating fake credit card, mules where they, I'll buy a plasma TV and send it to someone who will repackage it and send it off to Albonia for me. And, uh, and, and then I'll sell it there. All right, so I'm going to give you a snapshot of kind of two among a set of efforts that we've done in this space uh, that I'll do really quickly, uh, but I can point you guys to more detailed information if you're more interested. One is kind of uh, looking at trading markets and trying to characterize what's going on there. And the other one is looking at, at, at this, you know, banal traditional example of spam and trying to understand what are the real economics in that market. Um, so on the... Uh, <laughs> 
On the underground market side, through a partner, uh, we obtained records from about six months of one of the premier uh, underground markets that had about 13 million uh, messages in it. Um, and this is the public channel. So this is not actual transactions. This is kind of the moral equivalent to QVC, right? We've got you know, a special on you know, cracked machines in, you know, or uh, counts on Hotmail, whatever. And I, don't try to read all of these. These are just examples of, kind of the kinds of things that are people, people are offering. Uh, bank logins, uh, cracked accounts. Uh, these are all goods. There's another one for services. Um, actually, parsing this stuff turns out to be fairly tricky because it is not really English. So there is this pidgin form of English that is brought up that's spoken by lots of people who are not native English speakers um, that is agrammatical but has its own, uh, its own style. And there's a, equivalent pidgins in, uh, in Russian and, and, in, uh, and in, in uh, Portuguese and a few other languages where there's a lot of cybercrime that's transacted. Uh, and so we've spent some time trying to build up parsers, parsers for this kind of stuff so we can evaluate what's going on. I'll just give you some of the easier to read examples. You know, here's a guy, he's selling uh, CVV2s are those things on the back of your credit card at 90 cents a piece. Is there anything here that isn't obvious? Now these are all pretty, fulls is a term for uh, the combination of your credit card and everything that you need to monetize it. So address, name, mother's maiden name, uh, CVV2, so it's the full package. Um, I'm not going to go through all these, but there's one. So how many people know what a confirmer is? I was amazed to learn about this. So I have gone and I've stolen some, I, I've stolen your credit card or your bank account number, and I need to cash out. So I will do it through a wire transfer. Wire transfer is a very popular way uh, to, to launder the money and to actually to make it liquid. Um, now, the, the Western Union guys are wise to this. So when you do a transfer, they are going to call the sender to validate that, in fact, they wanted to send all of this money, and they have their experience statements, or they have some information about the person who's selling. So there is now a service economy for things called confirmers, which are effectively actors who pretend to be this person all right, and arrange to, have the, arrange to have them get the call. And so you will see, I, can, I am looking for a southern black female confirmer uh, for blah, 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 this number of deals. And they'll charge a commission, typically, say, in the 30 to 40 percent range for doing that. All right, so kind of high bit. Uh, we've really only scratched the surface here. Huge number of goods and services uh, that are available. If you wait long enough, you can find almost anything. Um, there is a semi-formal reputation system, which I don't have time to go into. Um, and a lot of assets. So just looking on the public channel of what people make available for goodwill. So this is like to basically prove themselves, to get into the gang. They'll put things available for free. We found uh, 87 unique uh, credit cards that were valid. Um, and for the bank accounts, $54 million in declared uh, bank assets, of which we estimate maybe 50% were actually valid. Um, so from here, let's look at one particular vertical market uh, that uh, makes, use of, makes use of this, which is spam. So this is kind of what a modern uh, uh, spam campaign focused on a product uh, uh, looks like. So there's someone who decides they want, they're going to make money uh, selling spam. They will make a contract, uh, not written. Uh, I should mention, by the way, that a lot of these malware sites, like the malware I showed you earlier, have really good support. So like iframedollars.biz, they have online 24-hour tech support. And you just, they, it, the window pops up and they help you. They're guys who have um, guarantees, like in, within 12 hours, if it's detected by Symantec, we'll give you a new version that won't be detected and you buy a, 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 an, ongoing, an ongoing annual uh, contract for their software. I mean, it's amazing stuff. So the guy who's spamming now the, contracts with some program who's actually the pharmacy, the online pharmacy who sells counterfeit drugs. Um, and basically they say, look, bring me, uh, bring me leads for every, I mean, it's just like normal, direct marketing. Um, bring me leads, you'll get 40% commission on every sale. The uh, spammer, in turn, then has to spam a lot of people. So they get an address list, and then um, they can either spam themselves, they can build their own botnet, or they can contract with someone who has a botnet to send the mail for them. Um, it'll go out to a lot of people. A handful will click. They will never actually get to the affiliate program. They'll go through one or more layers of uh, uh, redirection that will keep you from ever seeing the IP address of the person who's actually hosting that site. 
Um, that site deals with processing of the credit card and with fulfillment. They'll deal with uh, you know, someone, some outfit in India or somewhere like that that's making these goods. And then as frequently as not, actually, they'll send you stuff. You'll get something, and it may, in fact, have sildafinil in it if it claims to be uh, Viagra. We've, we have a partner who's done a bunch of these things, and, uh, and they test them out, and you know, it's the same, same percentages and so forth. They'll clearly counterfeit. Um, so if you want to talk about, let's figure out how good a deal this is, kind of you have this very simple inequality that comes from any kind of direct mail. The delivery cost needs to be less than the conversion rate, how often people buy times the marginal re revenue per sale. It's the same with LL Bean. Right? It's the same kind of uh, uh, market. Um, two of these you can kind of reason about uh, in a fairly straightforward way. One is the delivery cost to send. And one way you can reason about is you can go and try to contract with someone to send and see what they charge you. And these days, the going rate, the cheapest is actually in rubles. And, but converted over, it's now about $60 per million. Uh, and that's what it'll cost to get someone to send for you. Or you could just build the botnet yourself, and you figure out at your prevailing labor wage how many good programmers you think you need to build a botnet. Marginal revenue is even easier, because these affiliate programs um, uh, make their commissions public and, uh, because they want to attract more, more sellers. And uh, you can see what the pr average price of products is. And so the average price on a pharma sale is about $100. The one that's tricky, and I'm not going to go into all the technical details uh, to measure, is this uh, conversion rate, how many people click. So we did this uh, study between us and uh, the International Computer Science Institute for measuring the conversion rate by infiltrating um, the Storm botnet, which was a well-known botnet, and basically uh, confusing its command and control channel. So when it subsequently <laughs> went to send spam, it sent the same spam it was always going to send, except that for about 1% of all of its spam, it, the URLs in the spam that it sent did not point to the sites that they were trying to advertise. In fact, they pointed to sites that we ran. And so we created these two doppelganger sites, one that mirrors kind of one of these postcard sites. Here, click on this. It's a funny joke, awesome po or a postcard from your friend. Uh, and the other one that was a replica of a... Uh, fictitious pharmacy, Canadian pharmacy. And from there, we were able to log uh, how, how many purchases were made for how much and so forth. So I'm just going to give you a really quick look at the pipeline here. So in this particular study, let's just look at the one at the top, which is for the pharmacy. There are about 350 million spams that the botnet sent. You lose 75% off the front end. Only 25% even make it the first hop to the mail server they're trying to get to. So this line that's called MTA, it's a jargon term for mail transfer agent. That means when I try to connect to Hotmail.com, they say, I will not speak to you. All right? So 75% gets dropped on the floor before it even makes it to the mail server. Um, and the reason for this is largely the effectiveness of blacklisting. So um, this is a graph of uh, x-axis is how likely it was for something to be delivered before blacklisting. Y-axis is afterwards. Each one of these dots represents a domain. And the size of the circle is how big it is. So like, you can imagine like Hotmail and Yahoo and so forth are those big circles towards the origin. There's one exception up there. Um, so kind of up there, you have basically folks who are not making use of this technology. And our bots send to them successfully uh, before it's blacklisted and after a uh, host is blacklisted. Um, down here, you have basically the industry stalwarts who, don't, who have their own thing. They don't need it. They're not benefiting. And then there's this broad area where this is actually quite effective. As soon as they're listed on a blacklist, all of a sudden the probability of you being able to deliver goes way down. And remember this, because we'll get back to it later for why, um, who actually pays for this stuff. Um, then there's, does it get filtered in the inbox? I'm not going to go into detail on this part, to, except to say that the, the, the people who actually, uh, you know, the big webmail providers and the big good spam filters, they all do a pretty good job. Most of this stuff doesn't get through. Then, out of this 347 million, we get 10,000 people who visit. So we've already lost, you know, 99.99%. Um, actually, you have to first filter out all the security companies who visit, because that's a big chunk. Uh, um, and then of those people, all right, so actually one thing that's interesting about the visitors, if you plot it then down by the country um, to who the email was sent to, all right, what you find, and so that here the x-axis is the response rate for the e-card email, and the y-axis is the pharmacy email, what you see is that there's this two orders of magnitude difference between, say, USA, Japan, and Taiwan. They're 200, you know, 100 times less likely than people in Pakistan or India ever to click. 
All right? And there's no real difference if it's for Viagra or if it's for April Fools. All right? And that suggests that this is not purely education. And I think a reasonable hypothesis that we're trying to uh, verify is that what's going on is that the West has invented, invested in anti-spam. And so most of it doesn't get through. And so the developing world, in fact, does not have the capitalization to do this. So even though they have fewer people using the internet, more of their uh, messages actually arrive, and so the response rate is greater. And in fact, most of our purchases do not come from the United States. Uh, and then finally, 28 purchases out of 347 million. So the high bid is you know, 12 million spams to get one purchase. All right? Now let's look at the monetary side of this, because we could track the size of the cart. So uh, that was about $27,000 over 25 days, about $100 a day. Um, but remember, we were only looking at about a percent or a percent and a half. So if we extrapolate this as seven to $10,000 a day, even with that incredibly low response rate, and that's one campaign. I mean, there are gazillions of these campaigns going on. I will now wave my hands and say, let's imagine you extrapolate that for a full year, which you shouldn't believe at all. But if you did, it would be about $3 million a year. That's revenue. Take 50% commission. That's $1.5 million um, that comes in as marginal profit. Um, this would not be profitable if they were actually contracting this based on the rates that I quoted you earlier. The only way that it's profitable is if the spammer is the botnet owner. In this case, we know that that's the case. All right. Um, all right. So kind of the implications of this kind of analysis are one, they help you identify points of attack. So I'm not going to go through all of these. But for example, um, if you buy Viagra from someone, I can finish in two minutes. <laughs> uh, if you buy Viagra from someone and you complain, um, they will refund your money immediately. Right? And the reason they're much better, in fact, than real companies. And the reason, <laughs> the reason that they're better is that the merchant account is very expensive to set up. If you get a lot of chargebacks, then your merchant account is going to shut you down. Now you have to find another one. That's a physical face-to-face -face transaction. That's painful. All right? So once you actually map out the economics, you can now start to say, well, what parts of the value chain are most amenable to attacking? Rather than just uh, being a victim and saying, I need to defend every host, there are points where you can go on the offense and say, I'm going to undermine the economics of this. At the same time, it also suggests that there are better places for defense than others. Rather than defend your host, First, defend your e-commerce credentials. Right? Come up with a meaningful way that I don't have to type in a number that represents all of the, um, uh, all the authorization that I bring to bear. So you know, the equivalent things that you know, secure ID and a cell phone for doing transactions to Amazon would go a long way to making at least the financial transaction side of this less palatable for the bad guys. Uh, we're doing a bunch of other stuff. I'm just going to go ahead. So I'll take questions now. <laughs> I told you, I'm different from the other guys. <laughs> That's great. I think I'll just try to speak for everybody sitting around me. That was probably the most educational 25 minutes of the whole afternoon. Thank you very much.